Alright, uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Josh and today I'll be giving a lecture on opening decision making. So uh, to clarify exactly what that means that I'm, I'm not going to be talking about any uh, theory or any like broad ideas and any specific opening or anything like this. Uh, my goal is to talk about the situation when you don't know theory or don't know what moves to play. Uh, or like don't even know like maybe specifically the ideas, but just thinking about how you would play in a position uh, that occurs fairly early on and the mindset you want to use when you're surprised or don't know exactly what is happening. So uh, we're gonna be jumping right in here with a couple of games. So the first game uh, that we're gonna be looking at is actually a game that I was shown by a student. So uh, just a couple of days ago, I had a lesson with uh, Julian Proleko who works at this very St. Louis chess club. And in this game, he is playing black against Dalton Perrine. So both players are uh, NMs or I believe Dalton is actually an FM. And they're, so they're both around 2200 feet. So we're gonna be looking at this game. So uh, Julian goes for the Sicilian with D6 and so uh, Dalton decides to go for this sideline, surprising him very early with move 5 f3. So the move f3 is not unheard of, but of course it's nowhere near as common as the main move knight c3, which is much more common and much more natural. So here what we need to do as black when we are surprised in the opening is we need to start thinking immediately, right? So whenever our, our opponent makes a move that we are not uh, immediately familiar with, it's important to not just play on autopilot, it's important to take some time and figure out what is going on. So number one, whenever you see an unfamiliar move, and doesn't have to be in the opening, but just any move that you weren't necessarily expecting, you always need to make sure you understand what is the point of the move. So uh, the move F3, so if black makes some generic developing move like E6, um, white is not going to play knight C3 here, because if that was white's desire, uh, white would have just simply played knight c3 on the previous move and then followed up with f3. So the idea behind the move f3, um, can anyone tell me what that might be? Um, as you said, uh, on some random developing move, mm -hmm. we'll play c4, establishing a mirage c bind uh, setup. Yeah, very good. And what is your name? Uh, Caleb. Okay, Caleb, yes. Yeah, I remember our game, but not your name. So yeah, okay. So um, so so yes. So the idea of f3 is to prepare the move c4. So white wishes to protect the e4 pawn without obstructing the c pawn. And so if black plays a move like e6 or g6 or such, white will play c4. And uh, white wants to play with this Maroxy bind setup. So white's gonna be having a lot of space here and controlling d5. It's not inherently like super terrible for, for black or anything like that, but it is a position that many black players find to be uncomfortable. So uh, in this case, uh, so the important next thing to do is now that we understand what F3 does, we also need to understand why people don't play this all the time. So what I mean by that is like, so uh, this position after knight F6 has occurred uh, thousands upon thousands of times, probably in, my guess would be maybe in, even in the hundreds of thousands sort of order of magnitude. So, and in this position, probably 95% of the time, white plays move knight C3. And I'm sure that Julian, being a pretty strong player around 2200 feet, wasn't just simply going to just uh, just go into this position knowing nothing about it. So uh, of course, Julian had some idea against knight c3. So then against f3, it's important to think about, okay, so obviously not everyone plays f3. Pretty much everybody plays knight c3. So why does everyone not play f3? So generally speaking, if your opponent makes a sort of like offbeat move, there is a good chance that there is some drawback to it because, well, first of all, uh, most moves in chess are going to have drawbacks no matter how good they are. Um, but also just because like if the move is offbeat, usually it will be offbeat for a reason. Um, for the most part, people are relatively smart in the chess community and they're not going to continue doing something that is bad. So in the case of f3, so we need to think about why do people prefer the move knight c3 over f3. So one immediate reaction is to think that f3 is a move that uh, covers the e4 pawn very solidly but does not exert as much influence over the center as a move like knight c3 would. So there's actually uh, several ways for 
or pretty much one immediate way for black to punish this directly. So um, because white is not having control of d5, because there is no knight on c3, um, black can actually uh, go for this pawn structure with the immediate e5. Um, and so, so e5 is really good here because uh, in, normally white would want to have knight on c3 so as to preserve control of the d5 square, which has been freshly weakened by black's e5 advance. So uh, in this case, additionally, the normal square that white would like to place the knight on uh, when it is harassed from d4 would be b5. Uh, so you can see this as, for example, in the Sveshnikov variation of the Sicilian uh, after knight f6, knight c3. Uh, black wants, to, or white would normally want to place the knight on b5 in this uh, pawn structure. So the reason for this is because the knight on b5 uh, is relatively easy to reroute to the d5 square, whereas uh, b on b3, for example, it would be uh, much more difficult. So uh, going back to the game, so uh, if we're just looking at the case of f3, um, e5. So knight b5 here would be white's ideal place for the knight, but unfortunately white will find himself without time to play the move c4. So because after a6, uh, the knight is going to have to reroute to the a3 square if white really wants to play c4. And black has a couple of options here, but I think d5 makes a lot of sense considering the knight on a3 is very uh, suspect. So white most likely would end up going for knight b3, and now we can see that uh, because white has refrained from playing an early knight c3, in this position white actually does not really have control of the uh, d5 square at all. And indeed black can immediately simplify the position with d5. Uh, most likely we are going to see some sort of early queen trade and the position is going to be very safe for black. Additionally, it's also possible for black to play bishop e6, simply allow white to, to uh, implement his idea and then just play normal chess, which is also possible and perfectly fine for black. So the key here is that uh, by understanding the drawback of the move f3, um, we can get to the, an understanding of what the best move actually is. So uh, Shashwat Pande in chat suggests uh, e5 followed by knight takes e4. Um, yeah, unfortunately, this is a lot of, uh, of material, um, I think. Probably white should be fine after moving the king to d2. Um, yeah, unfortunately that is a lot of material, but honestly not the worst idea I've seen. Like it's definitely a typical theme. Um, but yes, so in the game, uh, Julian was not thinking about this. And so what happened was that uh, since Julian is familiar with playing the accelerated dragon a little bit, he decided to simply transition into that. And that's a really common mistake that people make when they're faced with an unfamiliar uh, opening setup. Um, People often try to uh, shift towards something that is familiar, and this is not always so bad, but it's really important to not uh, just automatically do that, since a lot of the time there's going to be a problem with doing so. So if we uh, just play a couple of moves, we'll see that we actually end up in a relatively standard uh, position. Um, so thankfully for black, uh, nothing has gone terribly wrong in transitioning back to the sort of accelerated dragon position. So all of these moves are fairly standard. A5, A4 is a really typical maneuver for black since a lot of the counterplay for black is going to revolve around weakening the C4 pawn. So castles, queen A5, rook B1, bishop E6, uh, all very normal moves. The bishop on E6 helps black to attack the C4 pawn in conjunction with rook FC8. So have rook C1, rook C8, B3, takes, takes. Uh, knight D7, extremely typical. Uh, knight on D7 influences the C5 and E5 squares very effectively. So after knight b5, now we have a point where black has developed all of their pieces to a more or less, um, to more or less just the most obvious squares. And now it is time for black to construct a plan. So there are several plans available for black in this position. And here is a point where definitely you would want to spend a lot of clock time trying to figure this out. Because um, again, all of our pieces are, have been deployed to the most obvious positions. And now we need to actually do make a plan that does something. So there are several moves that make sense. Um, one of these plans is uh, queen b4. Um, with the idea of bringing the rook into a2. And this is probably the most effective plan. Uh, due to the positioning of white's pieces, uh, the move bishop d2 is met by a queen c5 check, which is slightly inconvenient for white. Uh, perhaps at this point, white should strongly consider repeating moves with bishop e3, queen b4. 
And so uh, black is very likely going to be able to get the rook to a2, and there's going to be a lot of counterplay along the second rank. So queen b4 is one plan and probably the best. Um, another plan that makes a lot of sense for black is to play the move knight e5 and eliminate the strong knight on b5 with the move bishop d7. So uh, this plan is, uh, makes a lot of sense because if black is allowed to take on b5, then the dark square bishop on g7 is going to be extremely powerful. And if white ever elects to trade off the dark square bishops, then the imbalance with the black knight versus the white light square bishop is going to be uh, very favorable for black. So white would probably end up retreating the knight and black can choose knight c6 and continue to trade pieces. Uh, at any rate, black seems to have a fairly comfortable position here. So uh, instead, uh, Julian decided to go for another plan with knight c6 to control the b4 square. But the truth is that white does not really want to play the move b4 anyway, since the move b4 would severely weaken the c-pawn and create a lot of problems for white. So uh, again, not the most effective plan uh, being used here. So after knight c6, white played king h1, which is a move that is uh, generically very useful since uh, there are often various tactics along this uh, diagonal. And so now we can see why this plan is so uh, ineffective because in the case of knight b4, the most ideal move, uh, after bishop d2, the pin on the e1 to a5 diagonal is going to be extremely unpleasant for black as there is no obvious way to address the problem. So then here, uh, it's also very important for black to think here about how, sh uh, about how to play. Um, so again, uh, black's pieces have been developed to uh, pretty reasonable positions. Uh, nine on c6 is not optimal, but we have succeeded in our plan of placing nine on c6. So uh, now what I think makes the most sense is to play a move like queen d8. So this move prepares rook a2 and also prepares knight b4 since bishop d2 is no longer as effective now that it's not creating a pin here. Um, and yeah, so we can see that this is pretty clearly, this is an inferior version of the earlier line with queen b4, where the uh, rook is coming to a2 right away and queen on b4 exerts a lot of pressure in the position, but um, still nonetheless would be a pretty effective way to go. So yeah, probably queen d8 is necessary here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Julian, did, uh, I think he played a little bit too fast and ended up committing a tactical mistake with the move queen b4. So uh, the move queen b4, um, unfortunately the black queen is uh, entering the position, which is not inherently bad, um, but there are some tricks white has available. So queen b4 prepares rook a2, as we established before, and again black would be very happy to play rook a2 as the rook uh, creates a lot of pressure in white's position. But because of the unorthodox positioning of black's queen, and especially the fact that the knight on c6 is no longer on d7 and available to control the c5 square, uh, white has a really interesting trick here to uh, enact a sort of queen trap. So um, yeah, so the best move here is c5. So the problem for black is that the uh, most obvious move, d takes c5, will run into bishop d2 with a queen trap. It so happens that uh, the position here after rook d8 uh, allows black to more or less salvage the queen, but the position uh, that results from it is very much not acceptable for black. So knight takes b4 would simply drop the c5 pawn, probably starting with knight c7 is best. Um, and after c takes b4, knight c7, the doubling of the e pawns means that black should probably eventually lose the game. Although uh, there is some chess left to be played, but Definitely not what black wants to be doing. So then in this case, it is also very important to uh, make sure that you don't lose your cool. And just because we're losing the d6 pawn does not necessarily mean that the game it should immediately end. So Julian plays rook a2, which I believe is the best move. So yeah, we can see just how unfortunate it is that this new queen before was played because uh, now the d6 pawn is going to be exceptionally weak. Uh, generally speaking, if white is able to play c5 and capture on d6 in this pawn structure, it's going to be uh, quite unpleasant for black. So we have bishop c4. And uh, so here it would not be too great for black to take on c4 as pawn takes c4 would open up the b file for the white rook. So, and unfortunately, uh, Julian here makes a miscalculation um, and we are sort of beyond the scope of the lecture, but um, after d5, he takes d5, rook d8. 
um, and bishop g5. Yeah, Julian makes a sort of miscalculation here with rook d7. And after queen e1, it appears that white is going to end the game, since after queen takes e1, rook takes e1, bishop takes d5. Uh, unfortunately, at the end, there is a knight c3 with a fork on the two rooks here. And the rest of the game is uh, not particularly of instructional value. So what I want to bring to attention in this game is the mindset which you would use to make the proper choices uh, pretty early in the game. So especially here uh, in particular, I think this is a really good uh, moment to uh, do some thinking and hopefully by applying the mindset where you think about your opponent's idea and, their, uh, and the drawbacks of their move, you can reach uh, a sort of uh, punishment of the idea. And so here, this is one really important moment. And the next really important moment would have been uh, at this position, uh, where it's really important to make sure that you take some time and think about where you want your pieces to go and how you want to uh, implement a plan or something like this. So I think this is a really good moment where you need to spend some time to think about how you want to get that set up. And here as well with the move uh, it's very important to at least consider the move bishop d7, as it's very natural to want to make this trade. Um, yeah, and then from there, in this position, this is more or less a tactical misstep, and queen d8 would also be a more effective plan. Okay, so now we can move on to the next game. So uh, so in the, in the game we just looked at, there were indeed some uh, positional mistakes that happened in the opening, but this game that I played white uh, I played like the probably significantly worse than that, which is good because it's more instructional this way. So in this game was from the Canadian Open of summer of last year. Um, I was playing white against my good friend, the Canadian Fide Master, uh, Guanan Terry Song. So uh, the game starts with d4. So I know that my friend here plays the Benko a lot, so I just started, decided to start with knight f3, so as to sort of discourage that. Unfortunately, I did not realize that black can still play b5. So here is a moment where it's really important to think about uh, what exactly to do, because I've never seen this position, I had never seen this position before in my entire life. So uh, in this position, white has a lot of different options. So clearly the idea of black's position is that in the case of c4, um, this is very, this we've actually sort of transposed back to the Banco gambit, and uh, in this position, I believe black can choose between taking on c4 and playing b4 with a sort of uh, uh, Benoni structure with the bishop going to g7, and black should be relatively fine in either case. So pretty quickly, I decided I didn't really want to play c4. And another move, uh, knight c3, um, after b4, it seems like the knight on c3 is going to have to go to a suboptimal location. And so I also felt that black would have a pretty comfortable position here. So there are a lot of options here for white. Um, perhaps we can get some suggestions in the audience or uh, in the uh, stream chat, because there are a lot of different ways that white can play here, and they have different ideas for the most part. Knight c3. Oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? Knight c3. Knight. Uh, and what is your name? Um, uh, Woody. Woody. Okay. So knight d2 is very natural to prepare e4. Um, unfortunately, we are actually stopping the communication of our queen and d5 pawn, so it actually would be hanging here. Um, but so yeah, I did very briefly consider knight bd2 because it's a very natural move to try to play e4, but unfortunately it just doesn't really work out too well in this position. Um, I would consider e4, knight e4, bishop b5, trading my e pawn for the b pawn. I don't, I don't really want to do that. So, mm -hmm. so I would strongly consider a4, Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Um, yeah, the, the immediate e4 here, I, I had judged to be bad because after knight takes e4, uh, it is not possible to take on b5 as queen a5 check is, I think, winning a piece, right? Um, so, yeah, so funnily enough, the computer actually is relatively fine with playing this position down the pawn. Um, since on knight f6, it's going to take on b5. 
uh, when there's no such tactic. And on knight d6, bishop f4, the knight on d6 is very bad for black. But for me, this is this is this is very abstract. It's it's not clear to me at all why why I want to make this uh, exchange of my e pawn for the black b pawn. So yeah, it's definitely interesting. Uh, and a4, uh, we're going to talk more about a4 in a second here. So just hold tight. Uh, Gas fees official in the chat suggests the moves e3 and bishop g5. Yeah, I believe bishop g5 is is probably the the most like uh, I don't know if I should say natural move, but this is the most common move in this position if I'm not mistaken. And indeed, the idea is to capture on f6 and build a center with e4, which makes a lot of sense against Black's early queenside demonstration. So bishop g5, uh, probably this is the what uh, what would most likely be figure. Uh, what am I trying to say? Well, that the correct uh, mentality should lead you to, because uh, I mean, the computer rates e4 more highly, but uh, this move is very difficult to consider from a uh, to consider very seriously on a deeper level. And uh, move e3 is possible, but uh, just not really a very uh, ambitious uh, setup here. And indeed, after bishop b7. It felt to me like I'm going to lose the d5 pawn in return for the b5 pawn, and I just wasn't really too thrilled about that possibility. So in the game, I felt, OK, well, black is clearly intending to play bishop b7 and uh, attack the d5 pawn. And that's another a big reason why bishop g5 is so uh, sensible, because after bishop b7, now I can simply capture an f6 and cause black some doubled pawns, um, which is not the end of the world or anything, but definitely a little bit inconvenient for black. So yeah, probably. So I did consider bishop g5, and that's almost certainly what I should have done. And in the game, I did play a4. So basically, I played a4 because uh, I know that black does not want to play. Uh, black does not want to take an a4, um, since now the pawns would be split up, and after knight c3, you can simply can continue with e4 and have a very nice position. And uh, if black now wants to play bishop b7 and make the trade of the d5 pawn for the b5 pawn. Uh, well, there's many different ways that white could respond to this, but probably just taking on b5 is the best. And knight takes d5, e4 seems pretty good for white. Uh, knight c7, for example, would allow knight c3, and everything is protected. Uh, the b5 pawn is actually very annoying for black, since knight c6 is not going to be possible. So I knew black was going to play b4, and then I figured, okay, well, here that means that I can just play c4, and now my d5 pawn is going to be uh, protected. So now black doesn't really have any way to win the d5 pawn. If black takes on c3, I'm not terribly worried. I would simply take with the knight and proceed with e4. And we'd have a relatively typical uh, Benoni pawn structure. So black does the correct thing and continues with g6. And in this position, um, uh, it becomes very concrete, very fast. So in this position after g6, um, what white should play is white should realize that there is not going to be really any chances for an advantage with the queen side completely closed um, and develop normally. So there are a couple of ways to do that. Um, in this position, it's really important that if black, it's really important to realize that if black opens the center, um, this is very problematic for white um, since the queen side pawn structure favors black in most end games, uh, being the one who has more space. So. What white should do is white should play a move that should develop in such a way that discourages black from opening the center with move e6. So the best move here is g3. Um, and in playing g3 uh, with the bishop on g2, uh, black will very frequently have problems on the long diagonal after e6, d takes e6. So um, I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm not thrilled about white's position or anything. I find that most of white's pieces are not really doing much. Uh, in particular, the knight on b1 has to go to d2, which is from which is a square from from which it doesn't uh, affect the game too much. Um, so I wasn't really too happy about this. So I decided to play it more ambitiously. Um, yeah, it's kind of sad that from this pawn structure we are already trying to equalize as white. But I played b3, which is a move that feels very natural. But if we look at the game, we're going to see that uh, tactically this move just doesn't really work out. It's really important for white to get castled before the center opens up. So after bishop g7, bishop b2. Um, so here I was already feeling very uncomfortable about my position. So in this position, we should think about what black should do. So um, there's a couple of typical moves. The main moves. The main move that black should be considering is the uh, castling short, which is indeed the strongest move. But the reason that we're talking about it today is because black did not play this move. So the key idea here for black is that castling short is not the specifically important move, 
but rather uh, that black does not have to play d6, which is what happened in the game. So after castles, knight d2, um, black can actually save time here and open the center immediately, which is a really important thing to do because white's king is very far from being castled. And indeed, after e6, there is a huge amount of trouble for white trying to maintain the pawn structure. So uh, in this position, if white wishes to play e4, then after e takes d5, uh, white has a lot of trouble here with uh, maintaining the center. So for example, c takes d5, rook e8 results in a double attack on the e4 and d5 pawns, surprisingly, and white is in a lot of trouble. So perhaps white would have to continue with e takes d5, but then uh, after rook e8, bishop e2, um, there are a couple of options for black. I believe I even thought uh, knight takes d5 was possible with some weird uh, tactics like this. And overall, I just wasn't really too excited about playing this position. Um, either way, the opening of the e file is definitely not what white wants to be doing. And even if black were to continue with something like d6, um, yeah, definitely not uh, really excited about this. I don't really know what, where I should put any of my pieces. And uh, yeah, generally speaking, looks like black's going to be doing pretty well here. Perhaps knight takes d5 is actually possible here, since bishop takes g7, knight f4 is now more effective with the e5 square covered. So yeah, I knew that I didn't really want to be opening up the center. So in the case of, so if this had happened in the game, I would probably have to make some really awkward move. Um, d6 makes sense to keep the center closed, but just because of the specifics of this position, it can't really work out after bishop b7. It's going to be very difficult for white to protect the d6 pawn in the long run. So in the game, my opponent played a very lazy move, uh, d6. And I say this is a lazy move because uh, this move uh, is just sort of played automatically because, well, and he confided in this to me uh, after the game as well. He said, uh, more or less, he said, uh, well, this is just what you do, right? You just play a d6 in this pawn structure. But in this case, it's actually not necessary. And you can already start punishing white's very slow development scheme, especially with the loose bishop on b2. So anyway, so we have knight d2, castles. And then, uh, so in this position, white still should play g3. And again, try not to do much, too much in the center with the king on e1. Um, I wasn't really too happy with my position when I was thinking about this. I couldn't really think of a plan for white. But at the same time, it's also a little bit difficult for black to play, since both central pawn advances for black with d5 and e5 will create a lot of weaknesses. So most likely, white should be more or less uh, equalizing here, although that's not really what you want to hear when you have the white pieces against the low-rated player. So uh, I decided to continue playing very ambitiously for this reason, and I decided to start with e4. So after e4. Um, and this is another position where uh, my opponent decided to play lazily. So in this position, um, so the general plan for black is going to be involving e6, uh, of course, at, at some point in order to, again, as we were talking about, uh, create some pressure down the uh, e file. So uh, the question is, should black play e6 right now or perhaps do something else? Time is flying by. Um, so, OK, yeah, so this is actually a really interesting position because against virtually any move other than e4, uh, black should probably just play e6. Um, Gasfi's official suggests bishop g4, which makes a lot of sense, but uh, black does have a better way to start. Remember that white doesn't really have a way to prevent bishop g4 in the long run. So it's more important to solve the central pawn structure first. So against any move other than e4, probably black should just play e6. But because white has played e4, uh, black has a way to sort of make a double attack here, uh, believe it or not. So uh, in this position, uh, black is surprisingly close to being able to take an e4, um, as after bishop takes g7, knight takes d2. Oh, it's very unfortunate for black that white can take an f8, um, without which this would be fine for black. But okay, obviously, black does not want to give up the exchange for no reason. So the key for black is to start with the move rook e8. Um, so the key here is that not only is black threatening the move e6, so uh, so if white plays a move like queen c2, then e6 is very uncomfortable for white with the opening of the e-file. But also after a move like bishop e2, 
or bishop d3. In this case, it's very possible for black to take an e4. Uh, right, okay, against bishop e2, you, you, you take an e4, and bishop takes g7, knight takes d2, results in an extra pawn for black. Uh, it might not be that bad in the end because white does have a powerful dark square bishop, but you know, black is winning a pawn for very little. And, um, and in the case of bishop d3, I saw that black is now able to take on d5, and after bishop takes g7, so this really nice intermediate move here, knight f4. Uh, both bishops are hanging, and so I will not be able to save both. So in the case of rook e8, uh, most likely in the game I would have played queen c2 or something, but uh, this is definitely not a pleasant situation for white. Probably long castling is forced, and uh, I, I doubt I would survive for, for too long. So, um, and of course after bishop e2, black can simply play e6 as well, since the white bishop is not reaching the uh, quote-unquote optimal d3 square to protect e4. So rookie eight would be a slightly more accurate move order for black to execute this e6 plan. Uh, my friend ended up going for e6 immediately, um, which is a weaker implementation. So now this is a really important juncture for white. So um, for example, uh, I thought about a couple of different moves here. So the first move I considered was bishop d3, because, well, I mean, bishop on d3 protects the e4 pawn. But the line I had calculated was after ed5, cd5, and rook e8. Uh, I thought I was going to be having a lot of trouble here, since, again, not only is black threatening knight takes d5, exploiting the pin along the e-file, but there's also a lot of discovered attacks based on the uh, long diagonal, such as, in this position, knight takes e4, and knight takes d2, and black has succeeded in winning a pawn, and I definitely wouldn't want to do that. So that's why I didn't end up going for a bishop d3. But I also saw that in the case of bishop e2, rook e8, um, this is still very annoying for me. Uh, in the long run, uh, black should be able to take and play bishop f5 after knight e4. I will eventually end up in an endgame where the light square bishop will have to face a knight, and that is something that uh, I'm absolutely certain I do not want to play, uh, given that uh, the light square bishop just is completely held back by all of the pawns. And any endgame resulting in such is going to be, uh, if not losing, at the very least, extremely unpleasant for white. So um, the game, I decided that, OK, well, I don't really like either of these options. So I'm going to transform the pawn structure. And so I made a very poor choice to take an e6. Um, so what white actually should do is that the important thing here for white and with the thing that I want to uh, get across with the audience today is that at this point, it's really important to adopt the correct mindset. And that at this point, as white, you should just understand more or less that, uh, that there's not going to be any sort of advantage here. So I should just stop thinking about that and just forget about it and try to equalize. And indeed, uh, white should play bishop d3, and in this position, take an f6. Um, so this move, I think, is really insane to consider. Like, I didn't really consider this move very seriously because it just looks stupid. Well, okay, like, you know, like black is taking over the dark squares and such. Um, but the truth is that here, uh, the most likely situation is that black will eventually play bishop g4 and maneuver knight to e5. And at the end of the day, we're likely to reach an opposite color bishop endgame, which should be okay for white. And this is the most effective way for white to play. I mean, it's, it's very sad because white doesn't really have any winning chances here, but um, white is able to castle and eventually uh, try to maneuver the rook to e2. And white should be able to draw after some solid defense. So not optimal, but at this point, this is already the point beyond the point where white should be thinking of having an advantage. And I think that's my key mistake in this game um, where I was just thinking uh, I was just playing a little bit too ambitiously because I know it's my friend, I know he's lower rated than me, and so I ended up making some pretty bad moves that should have cost me the game. So after d takes e6, so I had already seen in the game that uh, I don't really like my position after either capture, but okay, at least I'm not losing a pawn to any discovered attack or anything like this. So in this position, um, this is a this is a position where, where black can consider a few things. So. Of course, black has two candidate moves, bishop takes e6 and f takes e6. Uh, both are very good. In the game, I was actually most afraid of bishop takes e6 um, because I thought that uh, black has a very simple plan here. So for example, um, what I figured was that eventually we'd have a position where uh, black is going to trade uh, a bunch of minor pieces and eventually go for a queen of six and knight e5. And we would end up in a situation where black is going to be having a knight on d4 against a bishop on d3. And 
yeah, that's that's definitely not an ideal situation. Uh, I believe this bishop takes e6 with this idea in mind should be around minus one. And in the game, I thought that uh, if this happened, I should probably just lose because uh, I felt that in a practical game, it's almost impossible to go wrong with black and uh, definitely wasn't really feeling comfortable about what was happening so far. But the move that my friend played in the game, f takes e6, actually turns out to be even stronger. So it turns out that I realized that uh, if black is allowed to play the move e5 at any point, um, then my position feels more or less lost. I don't really have any plan uh, because I so prematurely locked up the queen side. I'm definitely not going to be able to play f4 at any point. And so black just is going to be able to take over the d4 square and look for bishop b7, perhaps knight h5, knight f4. And yeah, I just, I just felt like this, this position was not acceptable. And indeed, it's not. It's around minus two or so. So in this position, I think I did the correct thing and, uh, and decided to go for some uh, things that may or may not be dubious. But at this point, like, I know that if I just play quietly, I'm going to end up in a losing position relatively quickly. So here, I decided to just simply play e5. So this is a very drastic measure of. This is a very drastic measure when it comes to um, when it comes to preventing e5. But in this position, it is definitely warranted. So uh, and then this position as black, it is your goal to try to figure out how to deal with this situation. So there are a few options here. So uh, the main candidate moves for black are d takes e5, which I saw, and knight g4, which was played in the game. So in this position after d takes e5, it turns out that white can't really effectively take on e5. Um, so I saw that bishop takes e5, knight c6. It's extremely uncomfortable for me so after bishop b2. Uh, black can do a bunch of things here, but e5 I think is very strong. And once the pawn comes to e4, white should not be able to survive for too much longer. And uh, in the case of knight takes e5, then black can make use of the pins with knight fd7. Uh, knight h5 is also very strong uh, because bringing the knight to f4 is a great achievement for black in this position. Um, and bishop moves can be met by queen g5 or things like this. So uh, yeah, more or less, white is not really able to take back an e5. So uh, the, the way I, f I figure white should probably just lose uh, is, my, is my guess at the, at the end of the day. Which is unfortunate, but you know, that's how it is. Yeah, the problem here is after knight takes e5, not only can black move the knight around and achieve a great position, but also if black just makes a normal move, uh, I can't really develop my bishop and prepare castling, so there's just not really any way for, uh, for white to reasonably play the game, and therefore uh, this position is pretty winning for black. But instead, my friend played knight g4, which is very tempting because it creates a lot of strong threats. So um, in this position after knight g4, uh, it's really important for white that, OK, so there's no way to protect e5 in the long run. Uh, for example, queen e2, uh, just knight c6 is possible. And the e5 pawn is going to be falling soon. So uh, it's really important here to try to solve the situation tactically. And indeed, knight e4 mixes up the position considerably. So now we're a little bit past the. Uh, opening stage, more or less, despite it being move 12. Um, but in this case, the situation remains extremely difficult for both sides to play. So uh, the move my friend played, which I actually thought was a very natural move, uh, the move knight c6, um, actually mostly discards the advantage. Uh, it's really important for black to uh, understand in this position that, uh, that there is a more or less winning attack present, and therefore black should continue with the move bishop b7 and try to maximize the pressure that is being created. Um, the problem with move knight c6 is that it allows black white to trade the queens a little bit too easily, um, and that is the problem with uh, this move. But after bishop b7, so what I had intended to play was knight takes d6, um, but after bishop takes f3, takes knight takes e5, um, I'd already seen, foreseen this in game that uh, this is pretty much losing, and uh, I, I would more or less expect to be uh, resigning soon. So, yeah, not my best uh, showcase this game. It would have been pretty unfortunate if that ended up happening. Uh, it turns out that there is actually a tactic which I just happen to have just by pure luck with queen takes d6. Since bishop takes e4, uh, queen takes e6, and queen takes g4 allows white to recover the lost material. Um, 
But in this position, the queen trade is a little bit more favorable as the f pawns for white are doubled and therefore almost certainly going to be lost. And in this ending with an extra pawn, black has a pretty good advantage. So bishop e7 is more appropriate here for black as they're very important to strike quickly. So the game after knight c6 takes, takes, takes. Um, yeah, in this position, now it is possible to say that uh, black's advantage in this endgame is pretty small for the most part. Um, so uh, the, the basic problem for black is that white has fairly active pieces now, and there is no inherent problem with white's pawn structure or anything like that. So in the endgames, black may potentially have problems with c5 or e6. So um, in this position, uh, I had already uh, thought that uh, the worst is probably over. And at this point, I decided to resume my strategy of playing for the win. So I thought rook d1 was a possible move, but I didn't really want to play this end game as black is going to install the bishop on d4. And I was pretty sure that I was not going to win the game. Um, so in the game, I played the move bishop e2. So now in the case of knight f3, I can, uh, or knight d3 rather, uh, is probably better, um, then we would simply reach this position. And uh, most likely, I would probably have offered a draw relatively soon, uh, as in my view, it seems like most likely opposite colored bishops are going to happen at some point. But it turns out that black actually has the slightly more difficult position, as, uh, as there are some difficulties with uh, developing the pieces. Uh, for example, bishop d7, uh, bishop e4 is a bit annoying for black. Um, so uh, black ended up playing another uh, lazy move here with bishop d7. Um, although the position is actually a little bit strange for black already. Uh, for the record, Stockfish likes the move rook b8, which I cannot explain at all. So, um, so yeah, bishop d7, but this move turns out to be lazy because uh, after rook d1, the idea of knight d3 is no longer feasible. So um, as, or I shouldn't say no longer feasible, but no longer as effective because now bishop e4 is going to be possible. A right, most obvious move for black and rook d8 will allow knight b7. So um, black may have to play rook b8. And now uh, I thought knight b7 was possible um, with a double attack on the c5 and d7 bishop. So um, rook d1 would have been much stronger, but instead I was really excited to castle because well, I just thought that, uh, well, you know, I haven't been able to castle for so long, so I was really excited to castle. But indeed, it is uh, a lazy move to do that, and it is important to uh, consider rook d1. So, and if black does not do that, then castling is going to be a lot more effective here, and white is actually going to be able to pretty shortly look to drive out the knight on e5 and obtain a pretty normal position. I believe white is even slightly better in that end game, perhaps. So after castles, uh, then my friend here plays the excellent move, knight c6. Um, so bishop takes g7, king takes g7. The idea for black is the uh, knight move knight d4, which is pretty much not stoppable by white. So um, in this position, I decided to uh, try to, try to uh, exchange my bishop for the black knight. So uh, in this position, like apparently the best move is, is bishop d1, which uh, I was definitely not really excited to play. Uh, of course, I saw it was possible, but after knight d4, uh, apparently white should play f4, and uh, th there are some concrete considerations that make it so that this position is acceptable. Uh, so for example, uh, white is intending knight b5, so in the case of bishop c6, then knight b5 is possible. And uh, just hoping to exchange the strong knight on d4. And if black tries to prevent this with a6, then after knight e4, it turns out the knight is very difficult to drive away from e4 without hanging the c5 pawn. So um, yeah, bishop d1 would have been more appropriate, but I decided that I was going to keep playing ambitiously with bishop f3. So uh, playing bishop f3, I had already anticipated that my opponent was not going to let me trade my bishop for the knight, as that position is going to be very pleasant for white with the knight on d6, and pretty soon doubled rooks on the d-file. So I'd already understood that black was planning to sacrifice the exchange on f3 and play knight d4. So uh, in this case, the double attack on the pawns on f3 and g3 is very serious. Um, but I had foreseen that the move knight e4 was possible with playing with the pressure on c5 being annoying for black. 
So uh, yeah, again, we are fairly past the extent of the opening, but there are a couple of moves that I believe are instructional that have yet to be seen. So for example, uh, an endgame that we had both misjudged was results after the move knight takes b3, uh, rook d1, bishop takes a4. So I thought that after rook d6, I would have really good counterplay since uh, the e6 pawn is hanging and black chooses to defend it, which is already fairly difficult, bordering on impossible. Then after e5, the move rook a6 is going to be possible. And after some bishop move, then rook b1 will force black to give up the c5 pawn. Um, but uh, the computer says that black can just give everything and try to promote on the queen side, and in the long run, it's almost impossible for white to stop it, which is a little bit amazing to me. But yeah, apparently black should just give up everything here and continue pushing the pawns. So this would have been the strongest continuation. Um, I had also thought that rook c8 was, was very possible here, as after rook fd1, e5, rook d3. So here I would have been like pretty much fine with this. In fact, I was going to continue playing for the win here. Um, but uh, then pretty soon after I was thinking about this, I realized that uh, I just don't have a plan at all. This knight on d4 is pretty much unassailable, and therefore I won't be able to do much to uh, get it out of there. And therefore it's very difficult to make progress, especially with my weak kingside pawn structure. But uh, my friend uh, ended up getting a little bit too greedy and decided to win back the exchange with bishop c6. And after knight takes d5, so it's true that black wins back the exchange, but unfortunately the knight on d4 was definitely a much more important piece than the white rooks. And uh, in this position, uh, white should have some small advantage as the knight is actually superior to the light square bishop here. Um, and eventually I managed to win this endgame after various twists and turns. So yeah, hopefully that should be a good example of, uh, you could think of it as how not to play for both sides. Um, goes to show that uh, even in relatively decent level games, there are lots of mistakes from both sides and all the time. So yeah, I just wanted to go over a lot of the key choices here, um, like a4, and pretty much every move that results after this is uh, bad from both sides. Um, yeah, bishop b, uh, this b3 move is not good because it doesn't really meet the demands of the position where I need to keep the center closed. Um, and yeah, this e4 move also has the same problem with uh, black lagging behind by playing d6 very early. Uh, yeah, here this is just a lack of a uh, calculation. I think that probably my friend just didn't really calculate anything and just played e6 because it looks very normal. But yeah, rook e8 turns out to be more precise. And d takes e6 is just completely horrible. And I should lose, but some miracles happened and somehow I was able to pull a full point out of this. Okay, so I think we have time to do the next example. It's relatively short compared to these. So, all right, so this is actually a game from later on in the same tournament. And in this game, I am playing black against uh, the Canadian um, WGM, Miley Jade ULA. So we're looking at um, a King's Indian here, which I had prepared and expected. So, um, here I really like the move Queen A5. So, the idea behind this move Queen A5 is that, uh, so first of all, the line knight c6, which is the most common move, uh, after queen d2 and queen a5, this has been considered for a very long time to be uh, a good line for black. So therefore, people don't really play into this anymore, and people play d5, after which there's a ton of theory that goes on. Um, but I really like the move queen a5, because first of all, the most obvious move for white is probably queen d2. But after knight c6, we transpose back to that line, which is considered to be good for black. And um, in the case of d5, which is another possible move, um, now black can get a sort of Banco gambit with b5 and a6. And this is a very good Banco as the white knights do not coordinate with each other very well on e2 and c3. So the other critical response for white is the move knight c1. And after c takes d4, knight b3 to try to recapture on d4 with knight. So this is a really interesting position because uh, after the move queen b6, which is a very strange looking move, uh, turns out that white has some trouble recapturing on d4. So in this position, if white takes on d4 with the bishop, then after queen d8, bishop e2, knight c6, and bishop e3. Uh, believe it or not, this is actually an accelerated dragon with white having an extra tempo. But white has used the extra tempo to play knight b3, so, which is not an ideal move. Uh, in fact, uh, 
I think we have some time, so I'll actually show what that uh, would more or less look like. Um, sorry, uh, so c4, bishop g7, bishop e3. So this would be like pretty normal stuff. So uh, in this position, um, you could, so if we compare this position with this position, we see that uh, white pretty much has uh, has the position after bishop e2 with, um, with the knight on b3. So if we compare this position with this position, again, white has an extra tempo in this case, but has used it to move the knight to a worse square. So this is considered to be a very good version of an accelerated dragon pawn structure. So uh, that's the idea in case a bishop takes d4, and on queen takes d4, uh, black is able to sacrifice the pawn here and obtain really interesting compensation in this endgame. Uh, in the long run, it's very difficult for white to hold on to the c4 pawn, mostly because the knight on b3 is not doing a great job. So this is just the theoretical idea so far. But the reason I want to talk about that is because I had previously prepared for the moves bishop takes d4 and queen takes d4, because I did not even think that this move knight takes d4 was possible. So here, this is a point where, again, it's really important to think about uh, the, to go through our process where we understand why our opponent is making this move. So, uh, so I'd known that I'd studied this position before, and I knew that I didn't consider knight takes d4 because it's not considered to be a good move. It's not shown by the computer. It's not played in human games. So uh, clearly, there is some reason why people don't play it, and I just need to figure out what. So uh, my first instinct was, OK, well, what happens if I take on b2? Because that just seems the most obvious, right? And uh, to be honest, I literally thought for like five minutes. And I don't know why it took me so long to see that after knight a4, the queen is going to be trapped uh, in a sad way. So bishop d2, queen a3, and knight b5 traps the queen on a3. So that would definitely not be acceptable. So then I started thinking about a certain position. So uh, in this position, there aren't really too many other moves for black to consider. and so the other move I was considering was knight c6. So it looks very odd, but the pressure, but the tension along the a7 g1 diagonal is actually pretty annoying for white. So again, if we compare to accelerated dragon, so this is a really good strategy where you uh, compare to other openings to see what has been changed. Um, if we look at this position uh, after d6 f3, um, we would have the position after queen b6. But black would have also castled uh, is, is the exact position in the game uh, if, we, if we look at this case. Um, and this is only possible because white has wasted so much time with the knight. Um, so that is why knight takes d4 is not so good because after knight c6. Uh, queen b6 is not a normal move in the accelerated dragon, but this extra tempo for black does make it actually possible. So in this position, it is now white's turn to make the decision here. So in the case of the move knight f5, which would be decisive pretty much if black had not castled, um, now after queen takes b2, um, so I saw that after knight a4, queen e5, black can get the, white is able to pick up the bishop on g7, but the extra pawn for black is pretty good, and indeed there's actually a uh, fun plan here. So I'd, I'd seen that, that this position is probably good for black, but I had already thought that uh, um, maybe white has some compensation in the long run, as the uh, loss of the dark square bishop is very unpleasant for me. But it turns out there's this nice plan with d5, and black is able to simplify the position due to a uh, weakness on e3. So, um, and if white plays a move like bishop e2, black is able to execute a classic idea with the queen on b6. Uh, they discovered attack knight g4. So after f takes g4, knight takes d4. Um, the b2 pawn is hanging, so knight d5 is not able to dislodge this on account of queen takes b2. And so therefore, black is going to have an excellent position with a beautiful pawn structure compared to white. Um, and the uh, knight on d4 is just absolutely perfect here. So now it's white's job to figure out what to do about this. So the main threat for black is going to be, be knight g4. So um, the most important the first move for white to consider is the move queen d2, which actually did end up happening in the game. Uh, the strongest move in, in the position is actually rook b1, since in this case, after knight g4, takes knight d5, there is no queen takes b2 available, and therefore black is going to be pushed off the d4 knight and lose the game. So uh, that is definitely not an option for black. Uh, I'd already seen that uh, after knight takes d4, and I just moved the queen somewhere. Um, more or less, this position would be pretty good for black. Um, the uh, rook on b1 is not an optimal move, and I will continue with pretty standard accelerated dragon ideas. 
But the move queen d2 is a move that is very natural and would probably be the preferred move if, um, if it worked tactically. So knight g4 in this case is not effective since knight d5 as a really powerful in-between move would end up winning something here. So, um, so here was the moment where, uh, unfortunately, queen d2 does fail to a tactical issue. And uh, again, this is, uh, or I shouldn't say again, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, the calculation from white is not uh, optimal here, as after knight takes d4. This is a pretty unorthodox tactic, but in this position, you really should be spending a lot of time as white to try to figure this out. So definitely findable. But yeah, really unorthodox tactic with knight takes d4. And the obvious move, bishop takes d4, loses to knight takes e4 with a really bizarre discovered attack here. So, of course, taking the knight would lose the bishop, and bishop takes d6, knight takes d2. Um, yeah, sadly, you cannot uh, capture the piece and retreat your bishop, and it is unfortunately not trapped as I can capture on f1 with a winning position here. So in the game, white took on d4 and ended up dropping the b2 pawn, which resulted in a loss. I actually played like really badly this game, and uh, I developed a super winning position and eventually blundered my extra pawn in it. And uh, I, I won the game anyway uh, due to some luck, but, uh, but yeah, definitely not a great game. But the point was I wanted to discuss the sort of thought process here, starting with uh, when I was surprised in the opening by the move knight takes d4. And here I was able to think about it, compare it with knowledge that I already have and use that knowledge as well as my calculation to build what I thought was the best move. Um, and indeed, I ended up playing pretty well here and it's, uh, so happens that it uh, is the correct punishment of White's idea. Okay, um, I think that's a good stopping point for today. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope that this uh, material is able to be applied to your own games in the future. Thank you so much.